listening to the Tom Hartman Program. And greetings, my friends, patriots, lovers of democracy, truth, and justice, believers in peace, freedom, and the American way. Tom Hartman here with you. And uh, in the second hour today, Matt Taibbi is going to be with us. He's got a blockbuster story about looting of our pension funds. But it being our first hour, Senator Bernie Sanders is with us. And with the uh, government shutdown, the, the recording studio over at the house is not working. <laughs> so you're here in studio with us. So we actually have a benefit from the government <laughs> shutdown. Bernie, it's so nice to have you right here in the studio. It's good to be with you, Tom. Thank you for joining us. So what's on your mind today? What's, what, what, well, what do you want to cover? Well, I think the... Big issue, of course, is the government shutdown. So let me just take a few minutes uh, to outline what's going on. Uh, the first point that everybody uh, should understand is that the government could reopen tomorrow uh, if the Speaker of the House, uh, John Boehner, a lot of vote. It's as simple as all that. He's got a bill on his desk. Well, he has the Senate bill on his desk and... What we now know is at least 20 Republicans have been public, have made public statements uh, that they would vote for what is called a clean continuing resolution, what we passed in the Senate. So it's no longer a debate whether the votes are there. The issue is whether Boehner is prepared to allow all the members of the House of Representatives to vote on the continuing resolution or whether he's going to remain hostage to 20 or 30 right-wing extremists in the uh in the house in this in the republican caucus so that's the issue that's number one number two uh it strikes me that in the midst of these very difficult economic times where real unemployment in this country is close to 14 percent, we have some 22 million people unemployed today tom uh where wages have gone down for millions of workers who are working longer hours for lower wages where the middle class is disappearing, what Congress should be doing now is creating the millions of jobs that our people desperately need. And we can do that by rebuilding the infrastructure, transforming our energy system, many ways that we can create jobs. The one thing that we should not do in this very, very fragile economy is to be telling 800,000 federal workers that they can't come into work and then telling an additional 1.2 million Americans who are federal employees, who are at work today, is thanks for coming in, but we don't know when you're going to get paid and if you're going to get paid. So you got over 2 million workers today. Vast majority of them are middle-class people. Vast majority of them, like every other American, struggles with mortgage and rent payments. They've got to send their kids to child care. They've got to pay their phone bills. Uh, you know, they have college debts. They have all the same financial problems that every American has, and they're worried that in two weeks, they may not get a paycheck. You know, as, as everybody knows, we had um, this tragic incident on Capitol Hill the other day, yesterday. And actually, I was out on the street there, and I heard the gunshots. And uh, I was there, and, and as I was walking away from the gunshots, police officers were escorting us back into the Capitol. Capitol police were running to the gunshots. Two weeks ago, we all know the tragedy that we had in the Navy Yard where 12 people got killed in the federal law enforcement people were there trading bullets with a killer that's what these guys do and we don't know if they're going to get paid these guys are going to get paid we don't know if people in the intelligence community are going to get paid we don't know if fbi agents are going to get paid we don't know if people dealing with kids in head start or the meals on wheels program are all going to get paid so this is causing just tremendous anxiety uh, all over this country and all of the economists tell us that when you have this type of government shutdown and people not getting paychecks and contractors not getting paid, this will have obviously a very negative impact on the economy at a time when we want to do the very opposite. We want to grow jobs, expand the economy. This is shrinking the economy. And that is just grotesquely insane. Second of all, uh, we have a situation where, according to the Secretary of Treasury, in a couple of weeks in mid-October, for the first time in the history of the United States of America, uh, we may be in a position where we're not going to pay our bills because the Republicans are saying, well, if you don't give us what we want, we are prepared to have the United States of America um, become a, 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 a deadbeat nation. Uh, we're just not going to pay the bills that we owe. 
Nobody knows what that will mean for our economy or for the world economy because it's never happened before. Mm. It's never happened that the world's largest economy yeah. has not paid its bills. At, at least it's not happened here. When it's happened in third world countries, they've seen the, 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 the you know, they have to pay 10, 15, 20 percent to, to float debt. All right. So what everybody does know is that it will be catastrophic. How catastrophic will it lead to a world depression? Who knows? Will it simply mean substantial increases in interest rates? Maybe. Surely. That. But we don't know. But that these guys are willing to go to the edge on that is beyond belief. Now, what is their whole demand? And, and here's the issue. I was very reluctant to be supportive of this. But what we passed in the Senate was a continuing, reg uh, a continuing resolution, which was a very conservative one. It really exceeded to the House on this. It continued sequestration for a couple of more months, which I really hate. I mean, that is underfunding all kinds of programs in this country. But I felt, all right, uh, along with everybody else in the Senate, in the, in the Democratic caucus, that we had to do this. And originally, Boehner had said, if you do that, we'll have an agreement. But he couldn't get that agreement through his right-wing extremists. And what they are demanding is that the only way that they will agree to a continuing resolution is if we defund Obamacare or delay it for a year or do something that will will essentially kill that program. Now, the point here that, again, everybody has got to understand, Obamacare was passed almost four years ago. I voted for it, but I am, have said time and time again, uh, this is a modest step forward. I happen to believe in a Medicare for all single-payer system, but what Obamacare will do is expand uh, health insurance to maybe 20 million Americans. And at a time when 48 million Americans have no health insurance, that is not insignificant. It does some other important things. So to my mind, it's not the end of the discussion on health care, but it is a step forward, and it should be supported. What these Republicans are saying is, if you don't kill Obamacare, we're not going to have a budget. We're going to hold the American people hostage. And interestingly enough, I think what many people perceive is, you know what their fear of Obamacare is? That it'll work. That it will work. Yeah. And what we are seeing amidst a whole lot of technical problems in the last couple of days is the first day that the exchanges were open, I mean, you had networks breaking down because of the huge deluge of phone calls uh, and, and web visits that were taking place. So millions of people, to nobody's great surprise, you know, when you got 48 million people who have no health insurance, guess what? They'd like health insurance. Mm. And when you got other people who are paying more than they can afford, if they can get more reasonably priced health insurance, guess what? They would like that as well. So what the Republicans are very worried about is that if this program works, uh, people are going to be strongly defending it as they do defend Social Security and Medicare. The truth is that in this country, the vast majority of the people do believe that the federal government should play a strong role in terms of health care, in terms of education, uh, and in terms of, of protecting our environment. And Republicans are very, very nervous about seeing Obamacare uh, succeed. So that's kind of uh, where we are right now. Is it, wouldn't it be safe to say that the net-net is that if Obamacare succeeds, it puts a lie to the re Republican meme that government can't do anything right, and therefore maybe we should trust government to, like, regulate banks and the oil industry? Yeah, I, it, it truly does. Um, and I don't want to get into this in a minute, because people should appreciate that this attack on Obamacare is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what these guys believe in. This is the Koch, brother, the Koch brothers' effort to kind of eviscerate government at every level. So we can talk about that in a moment. We will. Senator Bernie Sanders is here with us in the studio today. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour, our national town hall meeting. We'll be back with more of your calls for Bernie right after the break. This is the Tom got... Hartman program. Hot. And, oh, we're back. Oh, we'll be right back. And we are back, and let's pick up some phone calls here, Senator Sanders. Let's do it. Uh, 
Judy in Hot Springs Village, Arkansas. Judy, you're on the air. Hi, Tom. Hi, uh, Hi Judy. Thanks for taking my call. Senator Sanders, uh, I'm thinking that, and I want to know if, if you also maybe think this as well, uh, the GOP got a lot of cuts through the sequestration. They only restored what they want. Do you think that it's possible that they learn from that uh, experience and they're using the CR in order to get uh, the cuts they want because they're very busy restoring only the things that are getting a lot of attention? And by doing this, they can bypass the normal legislative process, uh, knowing that uh, these cuts would never make it past the Senate. Uh, Judy, you're absolutely right. What these guys are doing is picking and choosing. And every other day they're coming up, well, we want to fund veterans today, we want to fund this tomorrow, we want to fund that the next day. So they're reducing the whole legislative process of what government is about to saying, we will decide which agencies we want to fund. And Harry Reid has been very, very strong on this issue and saying that's nonsense. I mean, I think what we should appreciate, let me just read from a document that appeared in the New York Times so everybody knows what's going on. Um, 97% of NASA workers are furloughed. 94% of the EPA is furloughed. 87% of commerce, 82% of labor, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, today, Tom, we were supposed to get reports on unemployment from the Department of Labor. Guess what? We don't get them because those guys are, are furloughed, et cetera, et cetera. So they're picking and choosing, and that's not the way uh, you run a government. But here is, here is, I think, the bottom line. Uh, what the Koch brothers are spending hundreds of millions of dollars on and, and propping up candidates all over this country is the belief that the American people want to go back to the 1920s when we lived in a society where a handful of very wealthy people control the economic and political life of the nation. That's what they believe the American people want. They believe that the American people want to kill Social Security, Medicare, the Veterans Administration, uh, education, the EPA, uh, all of, virtually all of the legislation passed in the last 80 years that protect the middle class and working families. People don't understand this, but you now have a majority of the members of the U.S., Republican members of the U.S. Congress who want to abolish the minimum wage. Let me repeat that. Abolish the minimum wage. That means in high unemployment areas, if somebody can get a job for three bucks an hour, that's absolutely fine from their point of view. Which is almost indentured servitude. It is, it is indentured Actually, servitude. You could argue it's a violation of the 13th Amendment. No, you could argue <laughs> that, but the Republicans wouldn't. They would argue, it's freedom, Tom. <laughs> hey, don't you want to be a free guy and not have any health insurance and go begging maybe to somebody yes. to, to allow you to go to the doctor? Free That's to, what this whole struggle is about. Yeah, free to die like a dog in the street. As, uh, well, as, uh, you know, when, when uh, Ron Paul was asked that question at the, at the Republican convention, we have, what, just 10 seconds? 15 seconds. So, um. All right, my point here is that people have got to understand this is not just about Obamacare. And this is not just expanding federal health care. This is a fundamental debate about what government means. The vast majority of people disagree with these right-wing extremists. We cannot allow them to win. Senator Bernie Sanders taking your calls here on the Tom Hartman program, our national town hall meeting, Brunch with Bernie. More right after this. past the hour here on the Tom Hartman program. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour. Senator Bernie Sanders taking your calls. And Rick in Lawton, Oklahoma, you are on the air with Senator Sanders. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thanks for taking my call. Hey, Senator, uh, why do we even have a vote to raise the debt ceiling? This is something we've already uh, spent the money on. Well, Rick, um that's a very good point. I think what some of our right-wing friends are trying to suggest is that uh, by not raising the debt ceiling, somehow we'll be controlling spending. What you said, though, is, is true. What we are doing by raising the debt ceiling is paying off the debts that the United States government has already incurred. 
and not to do so would be to default and put the United States in a deadbeat position. Uh, but what they are doing by using the debt ceiling, which everybody knows, if it is not raised, could lead to catastrophic economic problems and financial problems all over the world. They are attempting to hold the American people and the Congress hostage and are saying, if you don't give us what we want, in this case, ending Obamacare or slowing it down, we're prepared to drive the entire world economy into very serious uh, distress. And that is that kind of blackmail. And I want to just say this as well, Ty. I know chatting a little bit more than I usually do, but some of this stuff is complicated. What we're dealing with is not just what's happening in 2013, and the president has made this point. This is an issue of precedent. We had an election. And you remember on election night, many of our Republican friends couldn't believe that Obama actually had won. Turned out he won by 5 million votes. They couldn't believe that they lost two seats in the Senate. They couldn't believe that they lost some seats in the House. They couldn't believe it. There must be massive voter fraud. The media is lying. It couldn't happen. Well, what this is about is trying, in, a, in, in essence, to annul the election. Okay? So what they are saying, we couldn't get our ideas passed by electing candidates. So what we will do is set the precedent that elections don't really matter. That if we're prepared to shut down the government or not pay the nation's bills, the majority are going to have to collapse and do what we want. If the president and the majority leader and the Senate accede to this blackmail, this will happen next year and the year following and the year following. And it will be a devastating blow to democratic society and free elections because elections won't matter. It's those people who are willing to take hostages who will prevail, and we have to make sure that that does not happen. Not now, not ever. It's definitely not the idea the founders had. John in Boca Raton, Florida. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yes, yeah, Senator Sanders. I often wonder, with such a large divide between the uh, Republicans and the Democrats in the Senate and, and in the House, when you're alone in the lunchroom, you're having lunch and you have lunch with a, um, uh, a Republican senator, do they... Ha- about the same things to you, or do they, is it like a wink and a nod, or do they have different ideas, or are they still um, as strong-willed and like this is, we're, we're going to shut the government down, or do they tell you things privately that we don't ever hear about? Well, John, that's a, that's a good question, and, you know, I think if you ended up talking to many of the Republicans, you would find them to be intelligent guys, nice guys, good family people, etc. So these are not evil people. Uh, But I think what's happening, and let me go to the House if I can for a moment, because I used to be in the House, and I know a lot of folks in the House, is here is what's going on, Tom. It is not just that you have 20 or 30 Republicans who are right-wing extremists who, you know, are are, are prepared to bring the country down unless they can repeal Obamacare. But here's what else, and this gets to the whole issue of campaign finance reform uh, and Citizens United that you and I have talked about countless times. What is the case, what my understanding is, having talked to people in the House right now, is if you are, say, a moderate Republican, and you're saying, you know, I think this is a screwy idea, I don't like Obamacare, but I don't think we should shut down the government and penalize two million American workers, I think I'm going to, you know, go to the Speaker and say, you know, let's move this thing along, let's, let's end the shutdown. The moment you do that, there's going to be some right-wing guy who comes to you and says, you know that, Joe, you do that, let me tell you something, you're going to be primaried. And I can tell you for sure that if it's the Koch brothers or some other right-wing group that has unlimited sums of money, they're going to primary you. And we have all the money in the world. So if you want to oppose us, you're going to lose your seat because we are prepared to spend an endless sum of money to beat you. That is, to answer John's question, that is one of the dynamics that are going on right now. So in the House, and I can tell you, John, and this isn't private conversations of which I've had, these are public discussions. Listen to people like John McCain and others who go to the floor. And what they are saying, in essence, look, we don't like Obamacare, but you can't bring the government down. You can't shut down the government or threaten the financial stability of the entire world economy by not raising the debt ceiling because you disagree. There are ways to deal with that. You know, we have a legislative process. So, John, it is what you're seeing now, front page of the New York Times today. Many of the gray eminences of the Republican Party, maybe the national leaders, past national leaders, are coming forward and say, we are really worried about what these right-wing extremists are doing to the Republican Party. Now, I don't stay up nights worrying about the future of the Republican Party. 
But mm-hmm. that's what they are doing, and they would like a more moderate stance uh, before the American people because they think their parties are going to go down the tubes if we continue moving in this direction. Yeah. Shane just told me we have just one minute until the break, which isn't enough to bring a caller on. Do you, how do we solve this? How do we get out of this? I'll tell you how you solve it. And, and we're beginning to move in that direction. If the American people make it very, very clear that they believe in democracy, they believe in the legislative process, but they do not believe that a small handful of right-wing extremists should be throwing 800,000 people out of work and cutting back on the services that the American people desperately need. They've got to make that very, very clear. And they are. And the Republicans are beginning to get that message. And that's why you are seeing more and more of the non-right-wing extremists coming forward. Uh, We now have 20 uh, people in the House, Republicans in the House, who say we are prepared to pass what's called a clean, continuing resolution. We are making progress. We've got to keep that going. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour. Be sure to check out Bernie's website over at sanders.senate.gov. We'll be back with more of our national town hall meeting with Senator Bernie Sanders right after this. Welcome back. Tom Harbin here with you. It is the, it's our Brunch with Bernie Hour. First hour of our program on Friday. Senator Bernie Sanders in our studio today, which is uh, the one upside of the government being shut down. He can't come in from the House Recording Studio, which is far more convenient. Um, and so it's great having you here with, with it's us. great to be here, Tom. Gary in Pocatello, Idaho. Gary, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Oh, thank you for taking my call, Tom. And Senator, it is an honor to speak with you. And I just wanted you to tell a president to stick to his guns and do not bargain with the, those terrorists on anything. To just tell them to take a hike. Well, Jerry, where we are right now is I'm happy to tell you, uh, as a member of the, as an independent who caucuses with the Democrats, uh, that Harry Reid, the majority leader, is standing very, very tall. Uh, and he has made it clear uh, to uh, Boehner and to the Republicans that they have got to open the government up. They can do it tomorrow. They can do it today. The votes are there, and they cannot blackmail this government in terms of not paying our debts and driving this country and the world into very, very severe, severe uh, economic uh, problems. Uh, I think the president is doing, is working hard, and he's doing a good job explaining the issues to the American people. But I have, in the past, been very concerned that the president has not been strong enough in dealing with the Republicans. But Harry Reid is, and he's tough, and I think the Republicans understand this. Tom and I were just talking during the break here that this issue goes a lot more, a lot further than just the future of Obamacare. It really has everything to do with the kind of government that the American people want. The people who are trying to destroy Obamacare, the people who are trying to hold our government hostage today, let's be very clear. They want to ultimately, sooner than later, later destroy Social Security. They do not believe that the government should be, entire, it, it, it should be involved in retirement programs. They want people to invest in Wall Street. These people made it very clear in the so-called Ryan budget, the Republican budget in the House. They want to voucherize Medicare. That means instead of having the strong Medicare program we have today, they want to give seniors a check, $8,000. You have cancer. Good luck to you. Go out. you got all the hospital care and medical care you need. Here's your $8,000 check. That will last for about two days. That's their view on Medicare. In terms of Medicaid, devastating cuts. Some of them want to privatize the Veterans Administration. They want to do away with the Department of Energy while we're trying to deal with global warming. They want to end the Environmental Protection Agency. So what this is about, this is a fight that really speaks a lot more than just Obamacare. It is what kind of society we are going to live in. I believe, quite honestly, that these right-wing extremists represent 15, 20 percent of the American people. And that is why, as Jerry just indicated, we cannot yield on this issue. We cannot yield on this issue, because if we cave now, 
these guys are going to steamroll all kinds of disastrous uh, processes through the through the House and, and hopefully make them law. John in Chicago, Illinois, listening to WCPT. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hello, Senator Sanders. Uh, my question is about the situation with the post office and their pensions. It seems to me that the original motivation for making the post office fund their pensions 75 years out was to fatten up the calf before slaughter. Uh, this, to my understanding, was done by people who want to privatize the post office, and it seems that you know this was just a way of uh, fattening up the deal for them once they were able to do that. So I'd like your thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Okay, what John is talking about is an issue that I have been deeply involved in, and that is the future of the United States Postal Service. What John is referring to is the fact that the Postal Service is the only entity uh, in the United States of America, public or private, that is forced in a seven in a ten year period to fund seventy five years of future health retiree benefits. Well, that amounts to about five and a half billion dollars every single year. So when you pick up the newspaper and the media reports, Postal Service losing billions, what they are saying is that every year the Postal Service has to come up with $5.5 billion. Nobody else in the world, or in the country at least, we believe in the world, has to do something like that. If the Postal Service did not have this onerous burden, they would be, hard to say, either running about even or making a few bucks or losing a few bucks, but certainly they would not be having the financial problems that they are having today, or at least that are attributed to the post office. So what we need to do, and I've introduced legislation to do this that has, I think, over 25 co-sponsors, which protects the Postal Service, does away with this onerous burden, gives them more flexibility to raise revenue uh, and to function in the 21st century. So we're working very hard on that. Uh, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of jobs here that some would like to get rid of. And ultimately, I think, as John points out, this is just not another institution uh, that some of our right-wing Republicans would like to privatize. Oneida in Montclair, New Jersey. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Oneida? Oneida? Oneida, I'm sorry. I, yes. I'm in Sanford, Maine. Oh, you are? Okay, my apologies. Yes, sir, I am. Okay. Uh, Senator Sanders, um, I don't mean to dismiss the importance of the CR, but I was just listening a couple of days ago to uh, Andy Goodman on Democracy Now!, and they had a guest speaking about the TPP, and what I heard was so alarming, talking about corporate control of our trade, SOPA, uh, taking away our sovereignty, loss of food safety, and, and uh, fracking and overriding our laws. Worse, worse than the WTO, and it was secret. And, and Obama is asking for a fast trade, a fast track, and 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 they gave the the Congress one chapter out of twenty five, and they were told you can see it, no notes, and you can't tell anybody what you're seeing, and Congress doesn't even know what it is. I'm asking you, what is it? What can you do about it? And how much do you know? Well. Uh, Anita, I know enough to know that this is simply a continuation of extremely bad trade policies. Um, and I know Tom discusses this a whole lot on, on his show. Uh, one of the reasons that we have lost over 50,000 factories in the last 10 years and millions of good-paying jobs has a lot to do with our disastrous trade policies. And that goes back to NAFTA and CAFTA and permanent normal relations with China and, and other trade agreements which by and large were written by corporate America with the goal of being able to shut down in this country, move to China and other low-wage countries, hire people there for a fraction of the wages, and then bring your product back into this country tariff-free. The TPP, as best as I can understand, is an extension and an expansion of all of those issues. Uh, so I will be a vigorous opponent of that. Uh, I think it will... Its goal is to continue the war against working people in this country and to benefit multinational corporations. Laura in Bristol, Tennessee, you're on the air, Senator Sanders. Uh, hi, Tom. Thank you for keeping the American people informed. And it's an honor, Bernie Sanders. And um, I would like to ask if you would ever consider running for president, huh? because you seem to have 
more of a comment in what, and you're interested in more than, you know, what the American people would like to see happen in the United States. Thank you guys very much. Bye-bye. Well, thank you very, very much, Laura. Um, to become pre- <laughs> I get these once a week, you know. Oh, yeah. it's a, it's a constant. Well, I, I, I very much appreciate it. And, you know, and I, I will say this, that I think certainly there needs to be a, in this ongoing debate, there needs to be a progressive voice out there. And, and I want to see a progressive voice out there. Um, Anita just called up to talk about the TPP. And millions of people share her concerns. And yet what we have seen for so many years, Tom, is this kind of bipartisan, Republican, Democratic, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton you know, approach to trade. American people want a different approach, financial issues, right? Everybody understands that uh, the deregulation of Wall Street has been a disaster for this country, caused the the terrible economic uh, problems that we're currently suffering with, and yet you got leaders in both parties who supported that. So there needs to be, there needs to be, and I think there are better people out there than me, but there does need to be a voice out there talking to the needs of working families. You know, what's happened in recent years politically is the Republican Party has moved very far to the right, and we've we've talked about that a lot. The Democratic Party has also changed. 30, 40 years ago, the Democratic Party was perceived to be a party of the working class of America. Very few people think it is now. I think the Democrats have done a very good job on issues like uh, gay rights, on, on women's rights. I think they've been strong, reasonably strong on the environment and other issues. They've done a good job. But on the fundamental issue about standing up for the working class and the middle class of this country and taking on the powerful, moneyed interests, I think very few people think the Democrats have been there. And we need voices now to start representing the tens and tens of millions of people who do not believe that they have a voice in Washington or in the White House. Yeah. And the fact is, not being a Democrat, you couldn't run in the Democratic primary. No. <laughs> it would be... Now, well, you know, it, but, you know, there needs to be a voice out there, and I, I suspect there are better voices than me, but I appreciate very much Laura's... Uh, yeah, we just we just have about 30, 30 seconds, five seconds, oh, five seconds to the break, okay. In, the, in that case, I will just remind people that we're talking with Senator Bernie Sanders. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour here on the Tom Hartman Program, and we're so grateful that all these years, it's been eight, nine years, something like that, it's been a long time. It's been my honor. Yeah, it, oh, it's a, it is such a pleasure. All these years, Senator Sanders has been with us. We'll be back with more of your calls for Senator Bernie Sanders in just a moment, just after this very short break. It's the Tom Hartman Program. You can check out Bernie's website at sanders.senate.gov. It's running while the government shut down, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. Okay, great. You can check it. We'll do that. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. Once again, that's Sanders.Senate.gov for Bernie's website. We'll be back with more of your questions for United States Senator Bernie Sanders. Bill, in Dearborn, Missouri, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. No, good afternoon. Hi. Senator Sanders, I'd like to... Uh, you're, you're on the air, Bill. I'd like, to, I'd, like, I'd like to ask the senator about subsidies that the oil companies and other companies get. Do they stop now that the government shut down? <laughs> No, I guess not. That's a very that's a very interesting question, Bill. No, they don't. Um, you know, the big money interests have built into the tax code huge subsidies for extraordinarily wealthy uh, oil companies for nuclear power. Uh, we have a situation now, and Tom and I have discussed this in the past, uh, where one out of four corporations in this country doesn't pay a nickel in taxes. What many of them are now able to do is stash their money in the Cayman Islands and in other tax havens where their their tax burden is zero and they don't have to pay any taxes at all. Uh, so we have a tax code which is very much uh, in sympathy to the needs of multinational corporations and the rich, and clearly this is an issue uh, that we have got to address. Yeah. Marsha in Inglewood, Florida. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hi. Hi, Tom, and hi, Bernie. I'm wondering if either one of you read the daily costs on October 2nd 
there's an article by Tom P. I don't know what the P stands for. It, the title of it is Wall Street, comma, the Chamber of Commerce are turning on the GOP extremists. And it says that having failed to persuade their traditional Republican allies in Congress to avert a government shutdown, business leaders fear bigger problems ahead. And there, and in bold letters, it says they're taking sides with a Democratic president whose health care and regulatory agenda they have vigorously opposed. Well, Marsha, I, I am familiar with that situation. And it is, <laughs> we are living, to say the least, in very strange times. Because here you have the Chamber of Commerce during the last election, having spent, I'm guessing, tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars to defeat Democratic candidates. Uh, you have Wall Street that, you know, has gone wild. Uh, you know, they hate any effort to re-regulate them, and they're willing to spend a huge amount of money. But what is happening now within the Republican Party, there is a real split. And that is the traditional owners of the Republican Party, which is big business, Chamber of Commerce, Wall Street. They are losing their control to the right-wing extremists and the Koch brothers. And what Wall Street and the big money interests understand, that if the United States, among other things, defaults on its payment, it will be very, very bad for them. And they are trying to tell their Republican uh, friends that you can't do this. This is really quite insane. And it's going to hurt us and it hurts the entire business community. And some of these guys say, well, thanks for the information, but we really don't care. Uh, so that is what's going on, Marsha. And, you know, I wouldn't particularly trust Wall Street or the Chamber of Commerce terribly much, but at this particular moment, uh, they are very concerned about what the right wing extremists are doing, especially in terms of not extending the uh, debt ceiling. You know, we once had a, uh, I think Treasury Secretary said, what's good for GM is good for America. But the reverse is true. What's good for America is actually good for GM. Right, in many cases. And, and, and that's, that's what the Republicans, the old, old line Republicans get, but these crazies don't. And so, um, I, I shouldn't use language like that. But anyway, Senator Bernie Sanders with us taking your calls. More of your calls for Bernie right after this. Welcome back. Ten minutes before the hour. Tom Hartman here with you. It's uh, our brunch with Bernie Hour Senator Bernie Sanders taking your calls. And Victor in Pittsburgh, Missouri, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yes, good afternoon, Tom. Hi, I'm Senator Sanders. Uh, I, first of all, I, I, I had uh, contact with my representatives, my representative and senators, um, uh, Bond, and uh, I tried to contact... Uh, Blunt and McCaskill are your senators. McCaskill, but she only had a message machine right. is full. And uh, I got a hold of Bond, though. He was very his, his his people were very receptive to what I had to say. And I said to pass the continuing resolution. Um, and you were creating such strife and such um, uh, animosity, and you're not going to get anything accomplished. Uh, and the thing that my question is this: What bothers me is that these Tea Party people, if they're causing then they're a small percentage, and they're creating this problem. And the way I understand it, the resolution is the proper way of order, the way I understand it. Yes. And they are not following the proper way of order. Yes. Um, and it's never, this is like revolutionary, like this has never ever been done before. I, I don't know if this has in the history of, of any, uh, any conflict. I think what we're looking at today is kind of unprecedented. Okay. Is there is there a way that you can uh, arrest these people and 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 uh, try them for terrorism and and financial terrorism and and uh, uh, to me they're, they're terrorists and and they're treasonous. Well, no, I don't think you can arrest them. But here's what is very interesting, and I I, I don't want to speak for Roy Blunt, who's one of your senators, but there have been a number of senators. These are conservative senators who have gone to the floor of the Senate. And what they have said is, is in a sense, you know, the point that Victor is making is there is a way to do things. There is a legislative process. Obamacare, or the Affordable Care Act, was passed by the House of Representatives. It was passed by the Senate. It was signed by the President of the United States of America. That is what we call regular order. That is the legislative process 
in our democratic society. Republicans took it to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court ruled that it is constitutional. Republicans ran for President of the United States, Mitt Romney. Republicans ran for U.S. Senate, House of Representatives, saying, we want to repeal Obamacare. They lost. They lost the election. And now what they're saying is, we don't care about the legislative process. We don't care about the Supreme Court. We don't care about uh, the recent election where Obama won by 5 million votes. We want to repeal it anyhow. And this is extraordinarily undemocratic. And many, and, and to their credit, many Republicans who I have, you know, politically disagree with very strongly, they are coming to the floor of the Senate and they're saying, yeah, we don't like Obamacare. Yeah, we think it should be defunded. But you know what? You've got to pass a continuing resolution. You've got to fund the government. We can debate that in the normal course of events. We can bring forth language and legislation, which will not win, by the way, and they know that. But they are in the minority. So uh, Victor's point is, is, a, is a very good point. But what these guys are trying to do is incredibly undemocratic. And if they succeed, it sets a horrendous precedent. And Obama made this point, not just for him but for future presidents. Warren in New York City. Warren, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Thanks for listening Hi, to WWRL. Hi, Senator. How do you do? Um, I wanted to ask uh, the Senator if you knew why the House has not uh, previously introduced what's called a discharge petition to force a majority vote. But <laughs> in the, while I was on hold, I noticed that actually this has been done, that there is now... Uh, uh, a, a petition that will uh, get the requisite signatures from Republicans to uh, amount to, I think, 218 or right. maybe That's 217 right. votes Good. to force it. And That's right. So what I wanted to ask the senator to do is to publicize this so that people understand, you know, as I guess he learned when McCain-Feingold was being passed, that the House rule is not the Hastert rule, it's majority rule. Right. And there is a way to do that. Right. All right, let me explain to everybody what Warren is talking about. When you are the Speaker of the House, uh, as Mr. Boehner is, and you control the Rules Committee, that is enormous power. By and large, you can control what comes up for debate. Unlike the Senate, where the rules are much looser, and people in the minority have much more of an opportunity to get their issues debated on the floor and voted, voted upon. But in the House, it's pretty tight control. Now, what happens when you have a circumstance where a majority of the members of the House want to do something, want to pass a bill, and the majority leader, the guy who controls the process in the House, says, no, I don't want it? Well, there is a recourse, and that is what Warren is talking about. It's called a discharge petition. Not used very frequently and hard to bring about, but it exists. And what it says is, if a majority of the members of the House, which is 218 members when they're fully uh, seated, 218 members sign a petition saying, we want this legislation on the floor, it has to get on the floor. So that's a way of going around what the, what the uh, speaker uh, wants. And I think there is discussion about that right now in the House. And I think that is, I think Warren is right. Uh, that is a very good, direct way to go. Because if you have a majority, you want to pass this thing, do a discharge petition, demand that this clean resolution get to the floor, it will then win, and we can end this terrible government shutdown. Can't discharge petitions, though, only be brought forward on the first and third Monday of the month? Or something like that? There's like a couple well, of days. Well, I don't know all of the rules. Yeah. It's been a while since I've been in the House. But... So uh, there, it, there are ways like to do it. Like I mean, away. Warren's basic point is correct, yeah. that yeah. that these guys can do it. And uh, if Republicans have the courage to sign that, along with all of the Democrats, uh, that's one well, way. You would we think at that point that, that um, Congressman Boehner would, just out of respect for his colleagues, not yeah. even go well, through the discharge the position is, process. The answer is more complicated than that. I'm afraid that's not the case. I mean, he is more beholden to the Koch brothers and the right-wing extremists at this point or more than he is to a majority, more afraid of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A remarkable. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. Our Brunch with Bernie hour is over. Senator Bernie, thank you so much for being with us. It's been great nice to be in the studio with you. Tom. It really, it really is, is very nice having you here with us.